Hi, my name is Romy Lawrence. I'm talking today about neuroadaptive Bayesian optimization for cognitive neuroscientists. So let's jump straight in. What are cognitive neuroscientists actually interested in? So we want to understand the fundamental aspects of cognition and the fundamental roles of distinct networks in the brain and how we even can modulate or enhance those cognitive processes. However, the standard approach using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, is often that we're selecting a task or a few tasks with a really pre-selected and small set of um, study conditions. And then we test this on a cohort of subjects and draw a group level inference. I argue though that there is quite a discrepancy between the kind of broad research questions we're interested in and the narrow standard approach we're commonly taken. And I think this has led to a lot of um, problematic developments in the field, first of all pertaining to human brain mapping. So we derived a very over-specified inference about functional anatomical mappings from drawing those inferences, because we can only draw them based on the conditions we tested in that particular study, but we can't make any conclusions about any other task out there we haven't even tested for. Another one relates to biomarker discovery. So we would be interested in finding task conditions that show us how a patient differentiates from a control or how also patient subgroups groups differentiate from each other. So far, we have not been very successful and actually a lot of patient groups show very similar um, deactivation or activation profiles to task conditions. And this could be because perhaps there could be a common genetic underpinning, as was like um, argued in the Spruton article, or maybe because we haven't really identified very sensitive task conditions that can pull those patients apart. Then another really interesting technique is non-invasive brain stimulation. And currently there has been a lot of confusion if it is um, working at all or not. And this could be because really of the limitations of the technique, or maybe the limitations of all those free parameters we have to choose beforehand, such as stimulation intensity or where to stimulate. And to address those questions, um, over the course of my PhD, I developed this technique where we thought, okay, let's just not start with a pre-selected task condition, but let's span a huge experiment space and then search through the space in real time and iteratively find the optimal experimental conditions. And we're doing this in this closed loop approach using, an, um, using a machine learning approach called Bayesian optimization. So you would start randomly with the condition. You're um, showing this condition to the subject lying in the scanner. You're analyzing the brain data in real time. And then you're trying to optimize for a certain target brain state. So you're trying to, for example, optimize activation in a certain brain network. Based on um, the signal you're getting from the fMRI, your algorithm will propose where to sample next. So that makes it completely closed loop. So before I go into application scenarios, I want to just briefly explain Bayesian optimization to you. It's a two-stage procedure that um, iteratively repeats itself in a closed loop. The first one is the data modeling um, um, stage using Gaussian process regression. Gaussian process regression, in our case, is a regression across the experiment space. So here you see experiment space, here experimental conditions would be aligned here, and we're kind of trying to predict the brain signal across this space. And Gaussian processes um, are really convenient for that because they're non-parametric and very flexible. So we can also do non-linear fits. And it starts with um, often selecting um, a kernel. So in this case, we used um, a squared exponential kernel. So this just assumes that um, task conditions that are in the space next to each other elicit a similar brain response. And um, this is our prior. So these are all the possible um, covariance functions we would expect before we even start the experiment. Once we collected some data, as here in this case, black dots, um, the space of possible covariance function shrinks. Um, because now we're fitting our Gaussian process. And the nice attribute is that we're not just getting um, the mean activation here in, uh, in blue or the mean prediction, but also the prediction of the uncertainty. And this information is being leveraged in the second stage where we're 
where an acquisition function, a so-called acquisition function, is being used to propose where to sample next. So this is the stage that closes the loop. So in this case here, in this example, we're using an expected improvement acquisition function. So we're trying to understand where in the experiment space can we sample to improve the expected, um, uh, yeah, the expected uh, uh, function. So in this case, we would sample here because here is the highest mean and also the highest uncertainty of improvement. So now, as you see, in the next iteration, we would sample here and we would expose the subject to this experimental condition and then refit the Gaussian process and then we recompute the acquisition function, we maximize the acquisition function and then we sample there. So this really is like a really broad um, and really quick overview of how Bayesian optimization works. But I really want to talk about um, the how we can employ this technique in cognitive neuroscience research. And really, I want to show and emphasize to you how we can ask different questions we couldn't ask um, using conventional methodology. So let's start with human brain mapping. So this work was motivated by the fact that frontal parietal networks play a crucial role in cognition, but we yet don't understand exactly how different frontal parietal networks differ in their function. And this is because um, if you expose a subject to various different cognitive tasks, it can lead to a co-activation of these two networks. So then we don't know what differentiates them. And then sometimes in very unpredictable fashion, sometimes these networks dissociate. Again, remember, a conventional paradigm would just expose a subject to one of those conditions and draw inferences. But we want to draw inferences, taking all those um, cognitive tasks into account. So what we're doing is we want to search across many different cognitive tasks in this closed loop fashion. So we designed a task space, a large task space consisting of 16 different tasks. And we're searching through this task space in real time with the idea to really trying to dissociate these networks, so trying to activate one while deactivating the other and vice versa. So this gives us a good understanding of the functional specificity of one of these or of, of um, both networks. And what we found was really remarkable because we found that different tasks seem to activate, um, for example, this more dorsal against other front parietal networks, then we would have hypothesized from this meta-analysis and also previous functional labels. And the same is true for these other functional um, uh, uh, frontal parietal networks. For more details, I would really um, like to advise you to check out the paper. But just to briefly summarize, we did find that um, results deviate from our previous knowledge about these networks. The cognitive tasks identified don't really share an underlying cognitive label process, which was really interesting to us. So I think it would be prematurely to label them now. There is a lot of intra and intra subject reliability. And we hope this could be a starting point for a neurobiologically derived cognitive taxonomy as opposed to a psychology derived cognitive taxonomy. Because we do think psychology um, is a discipline that predates neuroimaging. So all those developments have been made and all this taxonomy has been developed before we even ever looked into the functional organization of the brain. Um, our next study is for stroke recovery. So here the motivation really is that um, there is such a great um, heterogeneity among stroke patients. No stroke is the same, that we can't use a one-size-fits-all approach for them. And interestingly, we also know that domain general networks, such as the frontal parietal network, they play a critical role in stroke recovery. So if we could characterize the residual network function in individual patients, this could give us a really interesting and suitable biomarker for guiding patient-specific therapy, as we could understand how do these patients st still functionally work, and then if what kind of behavioral therapy could we uh, administer, or what kind of stimulation paradigm could we administer to them. But how would we do this? There are so many tasks involved, and how could we potentially do this and test this in an individual patient? So we thought, okay, neuroadaptive Bayesian optimization could be a great fit to address such a research question. So again, in this case, we chose a task space um, based on pilot data. So we um, uh, selected seven cognitive and linguistic tasks with um, three difficulty levels, and then we searched through the task space again 
um, in 11 patients and 14 controls. So now, first, I want to start with um, the controls results. These are individual controls results, and you see they look highly similar. So this is replicating our earlier work that controls, they have really high intercepted reliability. In contrast, patients, however, we really see that they have idiosyncratic profiles of residual network function, and they look very different from each other and also from controls. And doing a TSNI analysis, we can also see that patients cluster together in dark blue and that um, healthy controls are clustering together in turquoise. And interestingly, um, we also identified four patients that look a little bit like controls. So you see those here. And indeed, qualitatively inspecting their profiles, they look highly similar to controls. And also, when we look at behavior, those are among the best five performing patients when we use a really large um, um, test battery outside of the scanner. So we think this is really interesting because um, these um, profiles could be suitable biomarkers for then really um, administering patient-specific um, therapies. And then the third application is to use this technique to tailor non-invasive brain stimulation. So in the study I will be talking about, we're using a technique called transcranial alternating current stimulation. It's non-invasive and it um, really uh, applies like uh, alternating currents, so oscillations into the brain. The status, quo so the status quo so far in the field is to ad hoc define stimulation parameters and then test this on a cohort of subjects. But as you already know, how can we actually decide that those stimulation parameters work for everyone? There is a huge heterogeneity in anatomy and if we're looking at patients also in the pathology. So in this proof of principle study, we wanted to um, choose a really well-known um, uh, attribute or like um, a feature of this kind of stimulation technique, so-called phosphine perception. So at certain frequencies, people see like these kind of visual flashes. And we wanted to use this as a proof of principle to show that the method can work. So we spent like a huge um, parameter space consisting of different frequencies and phases. And then we searched through the space and then we asked subjects. Uh, so we always administered in each iteration, we always administered two blocks and then we asked them, where did you perceive them stronger? So this also highlights that Bayesian optimization can be used for binary judgment ratings. And then... Uh, the Bayesian optimization algorithm searched through the space and identified the area where there was the highest um, phosphine perception. And this really, again, I want to emphasize is just a proof of principle that the technique works. It would be much more interesting to optimize based on either behavioral or less, such as reaction time or accuracy data, or even neural data. So you can think that you're optimizing um, to restore a certain connectivity pattern or so in the brain. And then just like a brief outlook, I think this method and um, neuroadaptive technology in general has also implications for the reproducibility crisis. Because luckily, um, because we analyze and measure data at the same time, we have to make a lot of decisions about the hypothesis we want to test, about the target measure we want to analyze and all the analysis pipelines and also the kind of regions of interest we're interested in. So we have to make these decisions before we run these experiments anyway. And, um, but so we can actually pre-register those experiments. So we can write it up and either send it to a journal that accepts pre-registration or put it on the open science uh, framework. And the nice thing though to the uh, more standard pre-registration approach is that you don't have to be specific about the exact experimental condition, because as I said, you're spanning a large space of experimental conditions and then you're searching through in real time. So you can be in a way highly flexible because you can be still explorative on the level of what kind of conditions are you testing, but you're also still um, protected against questionable research um, biases such as p-hacking or harking and sharking, so to try to select the regions um, um, after you've seen your results. So we think it can improve specificity and generalizability of research findings and can be combined with pre-registration. So my take-home message for you is 
that I think neuroadaptive Bayesian optimization is an exciting tool for cognitive neuroscience. You can ask novel questions that you couldn't ask with standard methodology. The cognitive labels we are using may be misleading in the field and we should rethink of um, pursuing a more neurobiologically derived cognitive taxonomy. The technique can be used to advance precision medicine as it works in individual patients and has the potential to be really used as a new biomarker discovery tool. And then pre-register your neuroadaptive experiments. It's easy and kind of implemented in the, in the technique already uh, intrinsically. A lot of thanks to my um, previous PhD supervisor, Robert Leach, and all my amazing uh, collaborators from uh, a lot of different universities. Thanks for your attention and thanks um, that this uh, symposium was organized.